And we'll admit our guests, our uh, audience. Is my slide up now? Um, I don't see it. Okay. I've lost the screen that has the share on it. Oh, there it is, okay. All right, just a couple of seconds here. All right, welcome everybody to a Free Thinkers Corner Meet the Author event. Um, our guest today is Margaret Porter from New Hampshire. And uh, Margaret is, uh, I just lost my page here too. Give me a second here. Um, all right. Uh, so Margaret, she's the author of Beautiful Invention, a novel of Hedy Lamar. That's her latest novel. Uh, it was the winner of New Hampshire's 2019 Outstanding Work of Fiction Award. Margaret's the author of 12 other novels, including uh, A Pledge of Better Times, A Story of Ambition, Treachery, and Passion, Incorporating seven, or, sorry, 18th Century uh, Historical Figures, Royalty, and Events. She's also an actress, uh, film and TV extra, a uh, documentary uh, producer and script writer, a voiceover talent, and a university instructor. Um, before I turn it over to her, I just want to just say real quick that if you have any questions or comments for, um, for Margaret, please use the chat. Same thing, we're doing Facebook Live as well. Welcome everybody who's going to join us there. You can use the chat feature on that. I'll relay all your questions and comments to um, Margaret uh, to answer if we have time. Well, I'll maybe even pull you up so that um, you can ask yourself. So without further ado, welcome, Margaret. Thanks, Chris. It's great to be back, sort of, <laughs> at a free thinker's corner. Um, I am happy to welcome all the people who are joining us. Um, this is what it looks like when I'm actually at the free thinker's corner. Is the slide showing? Yes. Yep. OK, good. Yeah, and as Chris probably. said, um, I've written, I've written um, 13 historical novels from publishers like HarperCollins, Penguin, Doubleday, and others. And uh, Beautiful Invention, which is the one I'm talking about this evening. Um, about a year ago this time, I received the New Hampshire Literary Awards, um, New Hampshire Writers Project Award for the Outstanding Work of Fiction, which was very exciting. And um, I, I'm so pleased. There's just so much wonderful um, writing talent here in New England and in New Hampshire. So it's really quite an honor. Um, as I said, I've actually appeared in person at a Freethinkers Corner and it's a wonderful bookstore and I miss doing in-store bookstore events very much. So hopefully we can get back to doing that in the not too distant future, but please support your local bookstores through their online sales, um, local independent bookstores. They are really the lifeblood of the of the book industry and great, great friends to authors, local authors and um, authors all around. So this evening, um, well, first of all, it's Hetty's birthday. Hetty Lamar's birthday is today. She was born on November the 9th in 1914. And we have here her birth certificate. And you can see here um, where it, you see the word that looks like Israel. And that means that she was, her birth was registered as a Jewish birth. Her parents were both born Jewish and they lived in Vienna, Austria at a time when many of the upper class Jewish residents uh, tended to um, assimilate as they called it. And they would embrace the local religion which was Roman Catholic. So although Hetty was born as a Jew, Jewess, she was raised as Catholic and went to a convent school and um, was taught by the nuns. And I believe, you know, for whatever um, religion she considered, she seemed to consider herself Roman Catholic for the remainder of her life. Here's Hetty as a very young child. She was raised by doting parents. She was an only child. 
Her father um, was a very well-bred gentleman. Her mother had come from Budapest and she had been trained to become a um, concert pianist. So they were very cultured people. And Vienna at that time in the teens and twenties, um, after, after the World War I period was a very cultured place. It was a very uh, innovative place in terms of arts, music, psychiatry, <laughs> um, the Freuds were there. There was a lot going on and it was um, a very avant-garde kind of place, which of course was very exciting for a young woman growing up. And we have here, we have Hetty and her father and Hetty and her mother on the back porch of their home. They lived in a very nice uh, part of town, not too terribly far from the Vienna Woods. So that was sort of the local area where she could go and hang out. She loved to be outdoors. She loved to ski. She loved to go horseback riding, uh, but she was also very artistic. So she liked music and drawing. And um, here you see she's playing the piano. Of course, her mother being a con concert level pianist uh, made sure that she was taught piano. And she's got her little dog. And then this picture of her where she's um, sort of lounging on her on her day bed there, I think is a very um, interesting picture because I can imagine that she's lying there as a teenager and dreaming of, of her future film stardom. She loved attention, she loved to perform. She would perform plays underneath her father's desk in the library and use the, the knee hole part of the desk as sort of a stage. She would stage productions with herself or her dolls. And he was very supportive of her sort of histrionic um, abilities and he would give her an allowance so she could buy movie magazines and read about the film stars in Germany or even in America. So she was ambitious to become an actress from a relatively young age. Um, and then as a teenager, uh, she sort of um, got her way with her family. I think they were probably none too pleased that she wanted to pursue that profession as a profession, but she did go to Berlin and started work in films. And here she is as a very young actress about the time she was in Germany. She was given some very small parts and she did things like she, she sort of started out as a script girl, but of course she was very pretty. So she was noticed right away. And, and the fact that she was interested in becoming an actress it wasn't very hard for the director or the producer to, to want to put a face like that on the screen. In 1933, she was cast in a film that was to be shot in Czechoslovakia. And the original title of the film was Symphony of Love. And several actresses were considered for the part of this young woman who was um, somewhat like Hetty, she was a well-born girl with a doting father, is married to an older man, and is not satisfied in her marriage, and then meets a younger man, and they have an affair. It was, uh, the part was turned down by quite a few actresses because it involved, um, it required nudity and sexual content, which, you know, in the 1920s, 30s, uh, it was the time of uh, the, especially in German films, uh, lots of sexual license in the films. And Hetty was the one who ended up taking the part. She would have been aware that she would have to be nude in the part and that she would have to um, appear in a love scene in which she experiences sexual ecstasy. Later in life, she tried to say that she didn't know that the camera would be zooming in on her when she was unclothed and that she wasn't aware that these um, parts were in the script, but, but it, was, it, it was very apparent that, that they were. Um, and I think she, well, because of the, the backlash that there was, um, it made her want to sort of clear up the record. Here she is in one of the scenes. Um, she, there is full frontal nudity involving Hetty. And then she also is seen here in the throes of ecstasy. The movie was uh, a sensation in many ways. 
um, it was considered, and I think it, and it was planned to be an art film really in the sort of European art film tradition and, and to be a work of art and a, and a story um, worth being told. It's almost like a silent film. There's really very little dialogue and you can view it on YouTube. There, there are several different prints. There were, it was dubbed um, in other languages. Also the, the two men who were in the, in the film, the, the part of the young man, they, they filmed it um, in different languages at the time. So they had a German um, or Austrian playing the love interest in one version that was shot. And then a Frenchman played the same part in the French version that was shot. And because Hetty had been to finishing school in, she'd gone to finishing school, I think in Switzerland. And so she was fluent in the French. So they could use the one actress, no matter what language they were um, shooting in, but they used different, different men. When, um, when the film opened in Vienna and Hetty went with her parents, her parents did not react very well. So this caused a significant um, family crisis. And of course they were against Hetty continuing in films. And here she was, she'd been a star in a film with lots of publicity. So it was kind of her moment. Um, there, was some, there was some shocked reaction, obviously on the part of the public. Some people thought it was, as I said, you know, a beautiful art film and other people thought it was absolutely disgusting and it couldn't get released in the United States. It was uh, not approved by the censors. And um, Hitler was coming into power in Germany and he knew that Hetty was born Jewish. And so he would not allow ecstasy to be shown in Germany on those grounds because she was a Jewish actress. And so Hetty wanted to remain an actress, but she wanted she needed to do so respectably. And the best way to do that was to work on the stage. So to resurrect her um, reputation and to prove her abilities as an actress, she took on the role of Empress Elizabeth of Austria or Austrian Hungary at the time, who was a most beloved figure in, and still is in, in Austria. She, her story is quite interesting and there are plenty of films about her. The production that Hetty happened to do about Sissy was, was a musical, a stage musical. So she had to sing and she performed as an actress on the stage and did quite, quite a good job. She was not the first act, she did not create the part, but she was an understudy, I think. And then she was eventually put in the role and was a sensation. And um, there were good things and bad things about that, of course. She attracted the attention of a very important gentleman who, whose name is Fritz Mandel. Fritz was one of the wealthiest men in all of Europe. And I believe he was the third wealthiest man in Austria. He owned munitions factories and he, his companies produced all sorts of um, arms, any you know, torpedo casings, shells, bullets, um, just all sorts of things. He had several different factories located in different parts of Austria. And I think some in other places in Europe. He was extremely wealthy. He was older than she was. He was half Jewish. His parents had not been married at the time he was born, but did eventually get married. And he was very much the man about town, wine, women, and song. And Hetty at that time was just a teenager. She'd been through a lot as, a, as an actress. She was a sophisticated young woman and she'd had some love affairs. And, um, but, I'm, but she really met her match in Fritz Mandel. He literally swept her off her feet, <laughs> taking her out in the evenings, sending massive mountains of flowers to the theater on the nights that she was performing. And her parents were, of course, not wanting her to be actress, and so they saw Fritz as, as a pretty good deal that, you know, it gets Hetty off the stage because Fritz, was, Fritz Mandel's wife was not going to be an actress, and also he was just crazy rich. So it looked like Hetty was going to have a wonderful life um, with this man who apparently adored her. 
They lived in um, Offenheim Palace in Austria, not the whole building, but um, I think it was one or two floors. There's the, this is kind of the front of it over here. And then here's the, here's the facade. And they had um, a hunting trough out in the mountains. I think they had a ski lodge. They had a place in Salzburg. They were very, um, they could go anywhere and everywhere. They, uh, they would go to uh, Venice, they honeymooned in Venice, they would go to the, well, they honeymooned all over Europe, but they, you know, he swept her to the Riviera, um, all over Italy. It was, it was just sort of the dream life. She wore jewels and she wore fine gowns and they went to the opera balls and she was a leader of society as, practic as a teenager, really. She was a child bride. And here she is um, at the opera or the theater or somewhere. And she is sitting there in her fancy gown. And I believe that's Fritz standing behind her looking very satisfied. One thing that, um, that kind of changed things was um, the political situation in Austria. Obviously Germany was looking to expand its influence in the region. And everyone knew that Hitler had his sights on Austria. It was a German speaking country and it was right next door. And uh, Mussolini was also next door in Italy and was trying, Italy was helping Austria kind of not push back because they hadn't pushed in yet, but Italy was the ally that was supposed to help Austria when Germany came knocking on the door. And Fritz Mandel and his cohorts um, were very tight with um, Mussolini, who actually came to dinner at their house. Uh, they were, the Mandels were um, wealthy and influential and Fritz had a lot of money. And so he was funding what was essentially kind of a private army, but it was sort of quasi-political, I guess you might say, because it was supporting the government that was that was in power. Um, so here's uh, Fritz and his his cohorts, the von Starnbergs and Mussolini here, and they were all in cahoots, hoping that uh, their combined armies and intent would would hold Hitler at bay. That did not quite happen. The, the president of Austria was assassinated and there was a coup and then things were all right, uh, but the brown shirts and the Nazi party within Austria was rising up and everyone was in expectation that there would be a, an invasion at some point. Fritz having lots of munitions factories was of course very interested in what would happen if there was a war and, and there were already fights and wars going on. Fritz supplied um, armaments to Mussolini to fight in Africa. He supplied armaments to both sides in the Spanish Civil War. He had no particular morals. He was all about making the money. And he, um, interestingly, when you think what happened later, he did not allow Hetty to go into any of his factories. But at one of the factory Christmas parties, she said this much later, she met a German who was working on torpedo technology. And this is the gentleman, his name is Helmut Walter. And supposedly they had a little tete-a-tete -tete at, at the company Christmas party one year. Well, he was in Germany and he was working in Germany and he was working essentially for Hitler, uh, building up the uh, army and the manufacture of armaments, which was not supposed to happen after World War II, but of course it was happening anyway. Germany was building up for something and everyone had a pretty good idea what it was. Uh, one thing that, that Helmut Walter was doing was trying to figure out how to make torpedoes be um, able to be controlled from, um, through sort of wireless technology underwater. I believe was sort of where they were in the technology at that time. So Hetty had a conversation with him and we don't know exactly what that conversation was, but it um, probably bore some fruit later on. So here we are, here's Hetty. 
here she is. She's not looking very happy, young Mrs. Mandel. And indeed she is not. She would like to go back to being an actress. She's tired of being with society lady. Fritz is an extremely jealous husband. He, um, she accuses him of confining her, not letting her go places, setting spies on her with the household service. Uh, she has a couple of uh, affairs or tries to, which doesn't help the situation. And she wants, definitely she wants to go back to being a film actress. And Fritz does not want her to. Um, and in this, in this picture um, over here, this is the last time they were seen in public together, probably at the Salzburg Festival of Arts and Music. And Hetty's over here. And Fritz is way over here at the far edge of the picture. They are um, essentially, they're not yet divorced, but he is, uh, they're trying to decide which one of them is going to go to Riga, Latvia, which was kind of the Reno or Las Vegas of uh, um, getting divorces in Europe. So if you wanted to get a quickie divorce, you would go to Riga. And they were probably, one or the other would have done it. But uh, what happened was Fritz went on a hunting trip one day and Hetty said, oh, I think I'm gonna leave now. Uh, it's possible that Fritz knew she was going to leave and didn't have a problem with that. So Hetty went from, from Vienna to Paris to London. And what happened in London changed her life. Louis B. Mayer had come from Hollywood over to Europe and Great Britain looking for talent to scoop up movie talent. He was looking for um, people who were fleeing Germany, artists, musicians, actors, screenwriters who, were, who had been German or were in uh, contiguous countries to Germany who needed to get out. They weren't all Jewish, but a lot of them were, and the ones who weren't Jewish were leaving for pretty much the same reasons that it was not a productive situation. So after doing some looking around in Europe, um, Louis B. Mayer landed in London and moved then settled in Claridge's hotel and started, and, and also MGM, his studio had an outpost in, in England that they were collaborating and so, so he was also there kind of overseeing filmmaking. And one of the pictures he happened to be overseeing, um, as fate would have it, was, was um, A Yank at Oxford, which was a film in which a young woman named Vivian Lee was playing a, um, a coquettish wife of an Oxford professor. And uh, so interestingly, um, the future star of MGM's biggest, most famous picture ever, Gone with the Wind was uh, in, in Louis B. Mayer's orbit at that time. Although um, the, in the history of Gone with the Wind, it was actually a Selznick International production, but MGM funded it, MGM provided Clark Gable, and Louis B. Mayer was David Selznick's father-in-law. So, you know, it wasn't technically an MGM, but MGM had the distribution rights. Anyway, so Louis probably got a look at Vivian Lee and didn't realize what she would mean to his, his uh, life and future. Louis was especially interested in a young actress called Greer Garson, who was, who was here uh, in this picture. And Hetty Lamar had met Louis B. Mayer uh, previously in Austria when he was on one of his other trips looking for talent. And um, she didn't speak English. She had been in a naughty film. He wasn't interested in her. He thought she looked good, but he said, you know, I can't hire a woman who ran around bare-assed in the woods. So in a movie, so sorry. Well, Hetty knew that he was in um, London and so she got an appointment with him, went to Claridge's, uh, didn't speak much English, but one of the agents and producers of MGM was kind of aware of her and helped with the introductions, probably did the translating. And it didn't go too well. Louis did actually make her an offer um, with a contract offer, but he didn't offer her very much money. He did not offer her anything as much as he'd offered Greer Garson, who he had signed. And Hetty said, no way, Jose, and walked out the door. Then she regretted it and she wanted to accept the deal or at least continue to negotiate and found out that Louis B. Mayer was setting sail or had, was about to set sail from, uh, from France on the SS Normandy. 
So Hetty finagles a way to get onto the Normandy as a so-called governess or companion to a young violinist musical prodigy. Now, this was the great age of transatlantic ocean travel. And the ocean liners were positively palatial. They battled with one another for speed races who could get across the Atlantic faster. And the Normandy had a um, technical difficulty and ended up setting sail, then having to dock again, then set sail again, and they had, they'd had engine trouble. So this journey that should have been a lot quicker ended up taking, taking longer. And it was stormy in the Atlantic. And um, so Hetty was there on the ship and she ha had a first class ticket. So she was able to be in this, this is the first class dining room. It's positively palatial. You would, it looks like a European hotel. And essentially that's what it was. It was a great European hotel on, on the water. And so Hetty, there she was in her jewels and her gowns and her furs and all the men were completely agog. And a lot of the men were movie stars who'd been on holiday in Europe and they were all sort of coming back home together. And a lot of them were people that Louis B. Mayer had signed. And he saw the, uh, the response that Hetty was getting from pretty much everyone she met. And so they had a little, um, they had another meeting and another negotiation. And, and the upshot is that Louis B. Mayer signed Hetty and he said, you've got to change your name. And he named her Hetty Lamar because Barbara Lamar, which, who had been one of the most beautiful actresses in Hollywood and also one of the most doomed, she was a um, alcoholic and a drug addict and a sex fiend and all kinds of horrible things. But um, anyway, she'd been gorgeous and, and Louis still liked the name. So he gave it to Hetty. And so they, so Hetty signs on the dotted line and, or, or didn't sign, maybe it was only a gentleman's agreement at that point, but she was going to be an NGM contract player. And the, um, they needed to change her. I mean, she didn't speak English. She, they wanted her to lose weight, all of that, but she sure had the face and that's really what they were buying. And they also knew she had some performing experience. Here's Hetty landing, getting right off the Normandy in New York. And when she, when she, the ship docks, she um, is mobbed by the press. They found out that the ecstasy girl that had run around in the woods without any clothing on and had had, had an orgasm in a film um, was, was there. And everyone was wanting to know, what's, what's your next movie? What are you gonna do? You're gonna keep your clothes on in the next movie? And so she instantly on landing in the United States had the experience of becoming a sensation all over again on a whole other different new continent. She takes a train from New York to Los Angeles to Hollywood, which takes several days. And when she gets there, she's put in the, as they say here in the headline, the studio school for stars. And here's Hetty and her pearls looking like the well brought up lady that she is with some other uh, European acquisitions of MGM uh, learning learning English. And also the other part of being educated as a, as a film star in the contract system was they taught you how to walk, they taught you how to talk, they taught you how to appear before the camera. They, they really had a rigorous training program even before they, they put you before the cameras. And so what they, what they were preparing her for at this stage was to have a screen test. And then once she has a screen test, then, uh, then they decide what role she's right for and she might or might not test for a specific role. They might just do what they needed to do to put her on film. And then that test could be used internally at MGM or it could be sent to other studios. So here's Hetty again, getting the not yet star treatment, having her hair done. And here she is, um, she was up for a part in a film called The Toy Wife. And I believe this is a, either a screen test or a hair and makeup test for that. She did not get the part. She didn't get any parts. They weren't giving Hetty parts and she was getting very frustrated. But in her off time, she had a boyfriend 
an Englishman by the name of Reginald Gardner, who had been a vaudeville performer and an actor and was a very interesting person. He was a comic, a comedian. He was a, um, um, oh, I can't think of the word right now. Um, when you copy people's voices uh, and, uh, oh well. Anyway, he, so he, he would do um, impressions of people and impressions of things, trains and noises and all kinds of stuff that had been very popular in the vaudeville. So he ends up in uh, Hollywood as a sort of a suave debonair English leading man type person. And he and Hetty became acquainted and then they became involved, very closely involved. Um, he was an artist also. And so he drew this caricature of Hetty leaning up against the, the bar that he, the, um, in the party room of her house that he built for her. And then this is a section of a, of a nude um, watercolor that he did of her. Now, Reggie was very much a man about town, uh, was invited everywhere, one of the most popular uh, men to have at parties and dinners and things. And so uh, one night they went out to a party together and people were asking, you know, Hetty was, um, Reggie was the life of the party and so he's kind of circulating and, and everyone's wanting to talk to him. And at some point, um, Hetty strikes up a conversation with Charles Boyer uh, either in English or in French, I'm not sure. Um, his wife was with him. And he mentioned that he's doing a film, not at MGM, and that they're trying to cast uh, a femme fatale type part and that she would look like she'd be good for the part. Well, the director or producer happened to be at the same party. And so they huddled together and looked at Hetty and said, hmm, yes, let's find out from Louis B. Mayer if we can borrow her for this film. And that's what happened. The film was Algiers, and um, it was, Hetty didn't, I mean, Hetty was one of two women in the film, but she was the one that was the, um, the one that made, made the film, I guess you would say, and the film made Hetty, and she was uh, very, oops, I'm trying to get to so see this picture, there's a picture over here of, um, Reggie and Hetty at the premiere. And now I, oops, sorry. I can't quite get it to show, but anyway, so um, he's her date for the, for the premiere of her first Hollywood picture. She looked absolutely gorgeous. She plays a woman who's hanging out with an older man who's richer and more wealthy. And they're not married yet, but he's given her all these wonderful jewels and, and Charles Boyer is a jewel thief and they fall in love and, and it's all very, um, very 1930s. <laughs> I'll just say that. It was, and, and she looked absolutely gorgeous. Here is the uh, outside of the theater on the night of the premiere and here's Hetty's name in lights and she was so excited and she wanted someone to take a photograph so she could send it to her mother. Her mother was still in Vienna. And uh, by this time, Hitler was um, a, had either just or was about to invade. And so her mother was going to need to get out. And her mother did, in fact, get out of Vienna. Her fa Hetty's father had died while she was still married to Fritz. Uh, but Hetty's mother left and went to, to live with relatives in London. So she, her mother was, was out of danger at that time. So after Algiers, Hetty is the sensation. She's, um, you know, popular and beautiful, and everyone wants to know what the film will be. And unfortunately, MGM didn't quite know what to do with her. She was. Um, they, it was strange to MGM that that um, you know her first big role was at a totally different studio, and so now they needed to take advantage of what another studio had, had kind of built up and they were not sure what to do with her. In the meantime, Hetty and Reggie are on the town carrying on their affair and he's wanting to marry her, but she's had enough of marriage so they don't actually get together. 
he does a painting of her, which was shown at an art show. You can see him at work on the painting and there's the picture, which um, was inherited by his son. Um, he did eventually marry someone who was not Hetty. Hetty meets a gentleman by the name of Gene Markey, who's a producer and a writer. And a, I think he wrote novels and an artist, a caricaturist. He drew um, editorial pictures. And he was a producer at 20th Century Fox and did a lot of the Shirley Temple films. He and Hetty met, uh, he had been married to um, another actress and they had a daughter. And it was a fairly amicable divorce. And he met Hetty and it was a whirlwind. They did not know each other more than a weeks or months until they ran off to Mexico and got married. And here they are in the car in Mexico right after the marriage. And the picture beside it, that's um, at the Academy Awards ceremony shortly after they were married. They had a house up in uh, Benedict Canyon which was uh, where it had some property, it had an orchard. It was, it was very rural, very nice, um, separate from the hustle and bustle of Los Angeles. It was called Hedgerow Farm. And yet again, Hetty had kind of ended up as a trophy wife. Jean was um, a womanizer. He liked women, women liked him. He wasn't the most handsome guy on the block, but, but he, was, he just charmed women, charmed the socks off of them. And uh, it wasn't long, terribly long before he was charming socks off other actresses. And the marriage, um, they adopted a son named James. And as the marriage began to disintegrate, it was worrisome because at that time, a single, a single woman uh, was not allowed to have an, an adopted child. So the, the orphanage from which James Markey had been acquired, Hetty was very much worried that the, that the pending divorce would cause problems with losing her, her, her adopted son. But Hetty's real home was MGM. And here's a map of part of the studio grounds where Hetty spent all her time. Here's an aerial shot here. This is the famous arched portico entrance. This is the Irving Thalberg building, which was brand, brand new when Hetty arrived on the scene. And then here's Louis B. Mayer at his great curved white desk in a room in which he and Hetty had quite, quite a few um, head-to-head, -head, heart to heart talks and arguments. This is the MGM commissary. The people in the different production areas would kind of sit together. There was an area for the writers and an area for the cameramen. And I'm not sure it was even official, but everybody kind of grouped together. So MGM had Hetty and it's like, we've got this gorgeous exotic woman with a foreign accent who's just easy on the eyes, photographs beautifully. We're still not sure if she's anything of an actress, but we're gonna put her in as many movies as we can with all of our biggest stars. And that's exactly what they did. They first, they put her in a film with um, Spencer Tracy and it was a terrible script and it got worse and worse. And then it got better and better and the film got shelved and it delayed, delay, delay. And eventually it finally came out. They put her in one Lady of the Tropics with Robert Taylor where she played a kind of a half cast um, Vietnamese or Cambodian woman. They put her in films, two films with um, Clark Gable, Comrade X, which is a comedy and is one of, one of my favorite movies. Hetty had quite the flair for comedy in that picture. And I think it would have served her well in other ones. And then she was in Boomtown over here with Clark Gable and also with Spencer Tracy again. They put her in um, Come Live With Me with Jimmy Stewart. So Hetty was getting movie, important movies with important, with important stars, but she never felt that she was being able, that she was able to show her talent. And she was, you know, she wanted to prove herself and they were not really giving her the, the vehicles that would help her do that. Um, so what else is happening in the world? Uh, Germany has invaded Austria 
um, Hetty's homeland has been overrun. Her mother is in England, which of course is, is um, now the blitz is happening, the bombing of London. So her mother is in grave danger and she wants to try to get her mother into the United States. In order to do that, she would have to go through Canada and cross the ocean. And at that time, uh, the British government was sending many of their children to Canada to get them away from the danger on these transport ships. And one of the transport ships, well, actually more than one, but this was the worst, was torpedoed by the Germans. And many children were killed. And there were, I think it was 16 survivors that were a week at sea before they were finally rescued. And this incident had a very profound effect on Hetty. It involved children. She was the mother of a, of a young adopted son. It involved German torpedoes, which she knew something about. And it involved the fact that the torpedoes um, had not been detected and the signals couldn't be jammed. And she wanted to help the United States, which was not in any war at this point, but she wanted to share the knowledge that she had gained as Fritz Mandel's wife with the US government, with the Navy specifically, because she thought maybe they could develop some kind of undetectable weapon and that would, could be used against the Germans without signal jamming. But she didn't know how to do that. Well, luckily for her at that time, the government uh, was also interested in developing weapons and they had created something called the National Inventors Council. And essentially what this council was going to do was going to accept brilliant ideas or just any kind of ideas about um, weaponry and technology from the, like the general public or college professors, university professors, people who, scientists, anybody. And Hetty knew about this and she thought, well, my gosh, maybe I should talk to the, you know, if I can't talk to the Navy brass directly, maybe I should let this inventors council know, maybe there's something we can come up with. And, uh, but she didn't quite know what to do. And I assume at that point, she actually started thinking about her idea of how how the undetectable, unjammable tor wireless torpedo might work. Hetty was very close friends with the uh, MGM costume designer, Adrian, who is seen right here, who um, was uh, gay, but who was also madly in love with Janet Gaynor, who was a very popular film star, but who was ready to put up her feet. And they got married and they were very close friends of Hetty's. One problem that Hetty had at MGM was that Louis B. Mayer thought she was too flat in the chest. And he was, he was always making comments about how, you know, she was, you know, she had the looks, but she wasn't so great on top. Hetty wanted bigger breasts. She thought that would help her career. Well, Adrienne and Janet had a good friend whose name was George Antile. And he was um, an interesting guy who was a musician, an avant-garde composer, a writer, and a theorist about glandular, the, the power of glands. And he'd written a book, he'd written some articles about how um, boosting the glands could help with, I guess, hormones and boost the breasts. And Hetty, Hetty knew that Adrian knew George. And so they ended up at a dinner party together. And um, George thought Hetty, Hetty looked just fine up top and that she didn't need any enhancements. And she thought he was a really interesting guy. Um, she, was, she was divorced or divorcing Jean Markey. And I don't think she was interested in men per se at that time, but she was always interested in interesting people and and he was intellectual and he'd also written books about the coming war because he knew that the war was probably going to find its way um, to America or involve America and he had insights on on what was going on in Europe and how it would affect the rest of the world and she found all of that interesting having 
lived through it. And so supposedly, according to him, she wrote her telephone number on the windshield of his car that night after the dinner party um, with her lipstick. And so at some point she had him over for dinner. He came over for dinner and, and it was just to kind of get to know each other, I guess, or they, they were birds of a feather. At some point she tells him about her knowledge of torpedo technology such as it was and the innovations that Germany had been trying to make when she was living in Austria and she met Helmut Walter at the Christmas party and uh, that she had an idea for a, um, a wireless tor torpedo using wireless technology, which was really just coming into the fore at that point. Um, they were starting to have um, remote control devices so that you could kind of sort of tune a, a radio with remote control. There were toy boats like we have like we have now, remote control boats that you could take out on a lake and control it remotely. And she thought that somehow this, the remote control was an opportunity um, to prevent the jamming of signals. That if there's some way you can mess up the signal and so that you're directing signals in all kinds of different places. And one of the places is, is the right place to direct the torpedo, but there's so much um, action going on in the signals that the person trying to jam the signal and prevent it, the communication point wouldn't know what to do and wouldn't be able to stop it so that you would have this unstoppable torpedo. And it could be applied both in, in underwater torpedoes, but it could also be done through uh, the kind you drop from the sky. Anyway, so she had this idea. So she and George decided, George had also been a, an inspector in an army um, munitions warehouse in New Jersey at one point. So he comes at it and he also had, had, had um, composed for player piano. One of his big compositions had involved synchronized player pianos. And somehow her idea and his technological weird musical knowledge and his knowledge of armaments and her conversation with Helmut Walter all came together in an invention that they submitted to the National Inventors Council. This is George, his wife Beshke and their daughter Peter. And here's Hetty and Beshke and then George is over here. So she got to know the family and George and Hetty were collaborating on this pretty much at the time. He was composing music films and so he was semi-employed semi and she was making movies all day, every day. And the film that she was working on mostly at about that time was Ziegfeld Girl, which was a, a big musical. It had Lana Turner, Judy Garland, Hetty, uh, James Stewart was in it. And it was a big, big extravaganza. And you can see all these crazy costumes and everything. So Hetty was at MGM by day wearing crazy costumes tombs designed by her good friend Adrian and um, at night she was at home late in the night in this house which is not the house she'd lived in with Jean Markey which she had leased to another actor and she'd taken a house in Bel Air where she and her son and, and a servant were living and so it was crawling around on the floor of this house with matchsticks and pins and pieces of paper and all kinds of things that she and George were coming up with this um, invention of theirs. Also at about that time, she managed to get her mother to the United States. And here she is with Truda on the day she arrived. And her mother arrives with the little Scotty dog <laughs> who has traveled from, I don't know, I guess, I don't know if she had it in Vienna, but anyway, it'd come from England all across the ocean to Canada. And then from Canada, I had to get through, um, get the right papers and then get on a train and then come all the way to Hollywood. So this was a well-traveled pooch. Hetty, as a result of Ziegfeld Girl and all the other movies that she was making at that time was extremely um, famous now. So we've got, here we've got a selection of our, our Hetty Lamar paper dolls. It wasn't just one, there were lots of different Hedy Lamar paper dolls. Here she is with a sack of her um, fan mail coming in. Here she is, they're showing her as um, 
and her role in Ziegfeld Girl, Let My Glamour Dust Glorify You. Uh, wouldn't we all love to have some of Hetty's glamour dust? And then here's a picture of her where she's signing her autograph on eight by 10 black and white glossies. Now, um, interestingly with the, with the invention that Hetty and George did, uh, it sort of got buried and forgotten for decades and decades and decades. And people talk about it as a secret thing that she was doing. But in fact, it was not so very secret. Um, here, this is 8th of November, 1941. So the head of the National Inventors Council, then as you see, the inventions were submitted by amateur and professional technicians throughout the country. One of the inventions accepted by the council was submitted by Hedy Lamar. <laughs> Langer conferred with the United States Army official about that invention and asked, what do you think of it? Well, the Army would like to meet Miss Lamar, the official, and uh, so would the Navy. Well, yes, I'm sure. Probably not so much to talk about the invention, but we can hope. And here is the patent, which arrived um, about a year later, um, 1942, which is Hetty's patent, H.K. Markey. That's Hetty Kiesler Markey. Um, and this is the, and then George Antile, Hetty and George's names are down, down here below. And this is only one page of, uh, I don't think I have it handy, but anyway, it's a multiple page patent. There are lots of illustrations and then voluminous technical descriptions of how they're gonna make this thing work. And it's somewhat connected to player, piano technology with little dots and dashes and then the remote control stuff. It's really complicated. I had to figure out how it worked to describe it in the book and try to keep it simplified for, the, for a reader and also simplified for myself. And there was a time when I actually understood how it worked. And it's just been long enough that it, I'm a little fuzzy on it. So I won't go into the details and that's, it's, it's the fact of it, not the, not the technique of it. So here's Hetty, she's done an invention. They get a patent. Well, what's happened since they've done their invention is of course, Pearl Harbor. And that was a big deal in California because you know California is really close to Hawaii, number one. And, and there were actually some Japanese um, bomb incursion kind of fluttering things happening on the coast of California. So this, this felt very near and it also got the United States into the war big time. So there's the declaration of war. Hetty was on the set filming Tortilla Flat, which was another one of her movies with Spencer Tracy. I think she did three in all. And uh, they were had to be working on a Sunday, which it happened. They worked on weekends. They worked late into the night filming. And uh, when the news came in about the bombing of Pearl Harbor, they were actually in the sound stage and um, not knowing it's like the bomb could come at any minute once they knew what had happened. It's like, well, the Japanese could, if they hit Hawaii, they could be on their way to Los Angeles right now and we could be taken out at any minute. Well, that didn't happen, but then there was the declaration of war. And the Navy and the, well, the, the Army Department, which in its non-wisdom had not pursued uh, Hetty's invention to make, figure out how to actually make it work. Um, all of a sudden they needed to use all the weapons that they had already. They did not have the time or, or the incentive at that point to start inventing new weapons. They had to mobilize immediately. And that's what they did. And they also mobilized Hetty and Hollywood selling war bonds. They, so that became her big focus throughout for, the, for that part of the war. And there, was a, there were several, many, many war bond tours with the stars from Hollywood. And Hetty was, um, was one of a group of stars and they would kind of fan out across the country. Some would hit the East Coast and it all started in Washington DC and they met um, the important people. Uh, and Hetty had a tour of probably the building where her invention was sitting on a dusty shelf somewhere. And they then they fanned out all across the country on trains and buses and Hetty was mostly in the Northeast, kind of New Jersey and uh, Pennsylvania all around. And so here are some pictures of her. And she, so she would give speeches by war bonds and she sold millions of war bonds. You know, she was one of the record selling war bond saleswomen of, of the tours. She would sell millions of dollars worth of war bonds in, in a day. It was, it was just incredible. And the accounts of it were quite um, just mind boggling. 
one of my favorite incidents, and I, I can't believe I didn't know about this picture when I was writing the book. I read about it in the newspapers at the time. But she was at, at one stop and she hadn't eaten all day because they would invite her to luncheons. And then, of course, she'd give her a little spiel. And, and then, um, you know, then it, lunch would be over and she wouldn't get to eat or something. And so she was hungry all the time. And so she met this, this sailor guy and he, she was, said, must have said something about, I'm hungry. And the guy just handed her a sandwich and she took a bite of it. And then he's like, well, I'm never throwing the rest of this one away. <laughs> I'm keeping it forever. She was such, such a big star. I mean, she was just the total it girl and, and everybody loved it. I mean, you can see the women just lined up to get her autograph, men, women, everyone. They were just thrilled. And she would do different things to, to boost, the, boost the fundraising, you know, like if someone buys a thousand dollars or a million dollars of war bonds, I'll sing a song or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. She enjoyed it and um, I'm gonna, I'll just read something. This is part of the book that I didn't write. Henny actually wrote this herself, but she was asked by a newspaper to write, um, to express her thoughts on the, on the war bond tour. And it's just so, you know, to read an immigrant's words and how they, how they feel about America. Um, she said, at times I'm sure I know more about the freedom that we are fighting for than millions who are born in the United States and who have come to accept liberty as their rightful heritage. It must be fought for, won, and then cherished. America is the last stop for freedom. We've got to fight to protect it. And that is why I was glad to help in the government campaign to sell a billion dollars worth of war bonds. It is the least I can do. Great many people ask if selling bonds is a harder job than acting. I wouldn't know because I'm not acting on this job. You've got to be sincere to get your message across to the people. They know insincerity when they see it. When I return to Hollywood to start work on my next picture, I'll be grateful for my memories of this bond tour. It has taught me that America is even greater than I thought and Americans are a kind, generous people who won't give up their freedom. And that my friends is something worth knowing. So Hetty was a great patriot. I think she, she was not even yet a citizen at this time. She, had, she did become one. And then the other thing Hetty did for the war effort was at the Hollywood Canteen. She was good friends with Betty Davis and uh, Betty enlisted all the stars and the studios and everyone in Hollywood to provide this recreation site and rest site for the soldiers who were either stationed uh, in uh, California and within to reach of Los Angeles or those who were shipping in, shipping out, they could come to the canteen, they could see all the top performers and players and have a meal made by some of the top performers and, and, and actors, actresses. The studios provide a lot of funding, a lot of uh, the, the uh, uh, expertise to, to uh, renovate this giant old um, kind of a warehouse dance hall kind of thing and into this big club sort of. And Hetty showed up. She had two, I think two nights a week were Hetty Lamar nights or maybe it was just one and she took on an extra one and she'd show up in her Austrian dirndl and she'd dance with the soldiers and she'd kiss the soldiers and she would make sandwiches for the soldiers and serve sandwiches for the soldiers. And it was um, part, another part of her, her effort to, to do her part and help. She also invited soldiers to her home. By this time, she had moved back to Hedgerow Farm uh, with her son, Jamesy, e, and the servants. And oh, here she is climbing a tree with someone and then sitting in the backyard with some soldiers, just having a good time, uh, letting them hang out with Hetty Lamar. Also at the Hollywood Canteen, she met an English actor named John Loder. And here they are sitting, uh, probably they, they had cleanup duty and, and would do cleanup duty together. And he was divorced, newly divorced uh, from his French wife and, and they uh, fell in love and got married. And here they are on their wedding day. And here's how she told him he was having, she was having a baby. She showed up on a set or home or somewhere with a stork. And here she is with their first daughter, Denise, again, wearing the dirndl. And then there's a picture of her here with their son, Tony. And her adopted son, James E., uh, at one point went to boarding school. Uh, he was a bit older than these children. 
when Hetty was filming um, The Princess and the Bellboy, um, she was pregnant and they um, had uh, the designer make the, the gowns that she wore. They, they tried to focus on everything except the waist. Now you can't really tell that she's showing in this picture, but you can see from the voluminous sleeves and the, and the collar that they were intentionally trying to detract from the fact that she was pregnant when making that movie. Hetty got fed up with uh, MGM and decided to go out on her own and produce films herself. And she did. She was a, a, pie, a feminist pioneer in Hollywood. Uh, no one else had, uh, Betty Davis, I think, but nobody else had had a production company and tried to make films. And she acquired two properties. One was a play, one was a um, book, a novel, and made films from them. And she was both the producer and the star. And here's her husband, John Loder, was in one of the films and they were separating and about to be divorced at that time. Uh, the marriage was not destined to last, but they did make this film together. The mid to late 40s was not a great time. Um, the mo movies were not, um, you know, it was post-war. And so they there was a, they made a lot of war films during the war and then they made a lot of war films after the war. And then they, I guess Hollywood was kind of trying to figure out what to do next. But by the very end of the decade in 1949, Hetty had the opportunity to work with Cecil B. DeMille in Samson and Delilah. And her, her career had been not flourishing at this point. She was still under contract to MGM and, they, and that was frustrating and she was making movies elsewhere and then she produced her own movies. And, and so she got offered the part of Delilah and Samson and Delilah. And that was going to be, that was a very big deal. The movie took forever to film and Hetty said she wasn't gonna have anything to do with promoting the film, but boy, did they promote the film using Hetty, um, not in person, but, in, but visually. And her role as Delilah, she was quite the, um, and plus it was in Technicolor. And people, Hetty was beautiful in black and white, but boy, when you got to see her in Technicolor, she was quite something. This is the famous peacock dress, which was designed by Edith Head um, and is extant. It still exists. Um, I think it was in the Debbie Reynolds collection maybe, or maybe another collection of Hollywood um, costumes and it may be in the new Hollywood Museum, I'm not sure. But anyway, it was um, very great and iconic. Um, so 1949, 1950, Samson and Delilah has come out and that is the worst time for uh, film, films and actresses. The studio system's breaking up, they don't have the contract system any longer and they are, um, about to have to deal with the influx of television and television programming. People don't have to go pay money to see a film. And so they can stay at home and watch something instead of just listen to the radio. So uh, the 50s, not a great time. Hetty's in her 30s, uh, heading towards 40. And, and um, things kind of for Hetty Omar go downhill from there. She has lots more husbands some very ill-advised plastic surgeries, um, but she, she was a survivor and she did survive. Her goal and her dream was to see the dawn of the millennium and she lived to see the year 2000 and she died a few weeks, few days later in January of 2000. Um, my book doesn't go into, <laughs> my book ends on a high note, I'll just say that. And I did not follow Hattie's story through the, the later, sadder, um, years uh, intentionally. But uh, if you want to know more about them, there's a great documentary called Bombshell that had aired on PBS and was also a feature film in, in the cinemas. And it's um, well worth watching for the whole life story of Hetty and some really interesting interviews with people who knew her and I think her children are interviewed in it and so on. Um, one thing about Bombshell, they do kind of um, perpetrate some myths about Hetty and there are lots of them and I, Lots, one of the main one for me to the debunking of myths and then I'm, then I'm gonna be finished and we can open it up to any questions that you might have. But the story that Hetty told in after years about her runaway 
running away from Fritz Mandel was that she was desperate to get away, this controlling husband. He was keeping her locked up. She couldn't go anywhere without the servants spying on her and she had to get away and he goes off on this hunting trip. And she says, this is my chance. And she said that she drugged her maid, stole her maid, she took her maid's uniform, put on the maid uniform, sneaked out of the house, the big palatial house I showed you the picture of. And, um, you know, with just the clothes on her back and a handful of jewels, and managed to get herself from Vienna to Paris to a fancy hotel in London. And in fact, that, that is just so bogus. Um, number one, Fritz knew they, she and Fritz were on the outs anyway. It was very likely that she was gonna go. She didn't really want, any, want anything from Fritz. She just wanted her freedom. And eventually she got it. How they worked out all the details, I'm not very sure. But Hetty managed to walk out with a lot of jewelry and, and a lot of clothing. Um, the bit about the, the maid's uniform being like the only clothes on her back and whatever she could fit in this clothing, she could fit in a sack or whatever. I don't know. The story changed a lot over the years and, and um, was embellished and slightly different versions. But um, I, I just, I find it, you know, there's like this, there's this evidence that Hetty left um, Vienna with some pretty nice stuff. So here, she, here we see Hetty when she was married to Fritz as the trophy wife. And she's got this velvet dress with this cross bodice here and she's wearing a jewel. And then here she is on the same night at the opera ball and she's got her tiara and her diamonds and she's got her dress. Um, Flash forward, she's in Hollywood now, and she's being photographed for studio glamour porches by the great photographer Clarence Bull. Wow, look at that. There's the velvet dress, the very same velvet dress that she had in Vienna. I thought she left with just the maid's uniform on her back. How did how does she happen to have this? Well, how she happens to have it is because she took her stuff when she was on the Normandy and pressing all the all the people in her jewels and furs and clothes, you know, it was it was the stuff she'd had when she was Frau Mandel. Here she is again in the dress, velvet dress at a social occasion. She's talking to Norma Shearer and someone else. Um, that is the same. There's I also have pictures of her in um, Vienna where, with that fur. So that's. Um, and then here she is again at the New Year's Eve party with Charles Boyer, 1939. This is. Um, two year, two a year and a half, something after she left Vienna, and here's the the old standby, the the velvet dress. So so the story about the maid uniform and the drugs drugging the maid, I think, doesn't quite work. I don't own. I, I like to collect artifacts and ephemera connected to my characters when I can, and I've got lots of photographs. I've got thousands and thousands, as you can see from the pictures I've shown. I've got a huge heady archive. I don't have any autographs. I've got, a, I've got some printed pictures, but I did happen to see in an eBay auction this very interesting boot jack and I bid on it and I got it. And it's got, um, it's got Hetty's name and it's got 19 on one side and then it, whoops. And then it's got 40 on the other. And here it is. Um, I don't know the, what the, the provenance exactly. It was said that it belonged to Hetty and two things could be the case. Uh, she was still seeing um, Reggie Gardner at that time and he was a very handy guy and artistic. It's possible Reggie could have made it, but it's also very possible that Hetty made it for herself. She loved carving and doing all kinds of different kinds of things. She would go into the shops, uh, production shops at MGM and borrow um, wood and saws and she carved animals and she modeled clay, she painted, she did all that kind of stuff. So it could be that Hetty made it for herself, but I thought I would share that with you. And here's her star on Hollywood Walk of Fame. And that's all I have to say. <laughs> I've been rambling on now for quite some time and I would be happy to um, hear anyone's thoughts if they have seen or enjoyed Hetty Lamar movies or have any questions about um, Hetty or the book or anything else. That was great. Um, 
So the question I have is, what, um, what interested you the most about Hetty to write a book, a whole novel about her? It was the it was the frequency hopping invention. I was I was a film student. I, I have a master's degree in radio, TV, film, and had film history courses. We watched Ecstasy, um, and I. I did not connect Hedvig Kiesler with Hedy Lamar in that movie. I have to say, I probably had been pointed out. I knew about Hedy Lamar because she was my dad's movie crush. So I, you know, I always knew there was a, you know, about Hedy Lamar. If I was dressed up to go out and he thought I looked cute, he would say, "Oh, you look just like Hedy Lamar." So it was a name that I knew, and I can remember very clearly at some point in, I don't remember how many years ago, I was doing some just kind of just for the heck of it, when you're tired of living in the 17th and 18th century as a writer, and you have a liking and enjoyment for 1930s Hollywood and the golden age of Hollywood cinema. And I was just doodling around online and I think I was looking up something about Katherine Hepburn. I cannot remember exactly what, what it was. Or 1930s film, movie stars or something, photography of, movie stars and all these pictures and articles came up and and there was an article about Hedy Lamarr's um, invention of frequency hopping and how it had been the basis for Wi-Fi and GPS satellite all these kinds of things once it was actually developed for defense purposes which which it actually was and satellite technologies then it began to be um, extrapolated from and used in other ways. And I just thought, oh my gosh, that absolutely gorgeous woman that my dad thought was, had, was his movie crush. Um, wow, she was beautiful, but wow, she had a brain. What's the deal with that? And so I just decided to look into it a little bit more. I had to, I was under contract for a couple of books. I couldn't deal with it at that point. And um, so I kind of put that, wow, that's cool aside. And by the time I got around to thinking, I need a break, I want to write something in the 20th century. Um, uh, some books, there had been a couple of um, really good biographies of Hetty that were published, and also a book that was specifically uh, about her um, invention, her, the, her, the work that she and George did, and then what, how the invention was carried on, and it's called Hetty's Folly. And it was, it was very illuminating. And, you know, once I started, once I went down the research rabbit hole, I was just completely hooked. It's like, I have to tell the story. And so I did. <laughs> well, this was your first book set in the 20th century. All your other previous books are in the 17th, 18th uh, uh, centuries. Yeah. And most of them are, um, uh, uh, take place in Great Britain. Yes, that's right. Um, would you like to talk about those? Well, what, what, what um, was it about that that interested you as far as getting into British history versus you know you know staying with like American history? Uh, well, I, I as, an, as an undergraduate, I studied Tudor and Stuart history both in the United States and in England, and I read a lot of English history and English literature. So. That was a natural fit for me. Um, the Jane Austen period is where you know what I started out with, and then um, I um, a, a lot of my books were um, made up stories, and then I started to get more into historical fiction that was based on real people. The last um, historical, the last romantic historical novel I wrote which is about, they're about to be republished. The, I did a trilogy set on the Isle of Man, which um, is coming out in a, a three book ebook edition very shortly. And um, by the time I got to the third book, every character in that book was a real person except the two main characters. And it was at that point that I said, I really, I wanna write about, I need to be writing about real people. When I was a kid, I was always reading um, young adult biographies of Queens and, doctors and you know um, Louisa May Alcott and Clara Barton and Queen Elizabeth and all that kind of stuff that they're geared to the youth um, youth readership and so I'd already read done the reading about the you know fiction about real people so I and that's so 
since since that light went off, it's like, oh, this is what I should be doing. I want to write novels about real people. I picked and chose um, real people to write about. And um, the next the next book is another Hollywood book. And it's about a real person. And but this person is not famous in her own right, but she's famous adjacent because she has a connection to Ginger Rogers. So I've been um, I've gone from watching Hedy Lamar movies all the time to watching a lot of Rogers and Astaire movies, which is a really great thing to do when call you can call it research. It's like, oh, okay, <laughs> I think I'll watch the gay divorcee today and call it work. Um, so that's that's been a lot of fun. Um, but then, um, so I've done so the two Hollywood books, and then the one that I'm starting um, now is back to the 18th century, and it's about um, a real person um, in the 18th, and it's, I'm going back to the 18th century theater setting. So as a former actress, <laughs> someone who um, spent lots of time on film sets myself, I kind of, you might say I'm in a rut, I, but I just like looking and um, fictionally at the performing arts through people, especially women, when it was um, in earlier years, earlier centuries, it was one of the few ways a woman could be a professional and make a living and support herself. And then um, later on, it was, uh, you know, you get someone like Hetty who gets put in the films because she's beautiful and, and uh, but there's more going on behind the face. So that's, I don't know if that answered the question, but. Yeah, yeah. Um, you, do, you do a lot of travel. Well, you used to do. <laughs> COVID well, permitting, of course. I traveled all the uh, way to the living room for this event, but yeah, <laughs> I'll travel to the kitchen when I empty my teacup. Right, right. Um, for your other novels, though, you you would go, I read that every year you go over, you and your husband would go over to Britain, Great Britain yes. over to England. Um, did you, is that where you did a lot of your uh, research for your previous novels? Absolutely. And for upcoming, you know, thank goodness. Um, I always know well in advance sort of what I'm going to be writing years down the road. And so I take advantage to, do, to be doing multiple um, research grabs when I'm over there. And I'm so happy that I have done that because now I'm not, I mean, I would love to be able to travel, don't get me wrong, but I don't need to travel because I've done all, I've been, you know, done my research in the British Library and I've been to the sites and I've done a lot of stuff. Now I just, it's the refreshing of the memory and finding which camera memory card has all the pictures from the on-site places that I went to research a book. So, but yeah, that's, um, that's different. We were definitely supposed to be in the UK once if not twice this year. So that was, um, but it's okay, it's okay. I mean, it's, it's great and um, to be able to do that and I look forward to doing it again, but it's also great to enjoy all four seasons here in, uh, in New Hampshire, so. Now I read on your, your website that you got your uh, start to your writing career by writing a grammar school newspaper, newsletter. Fourth grade, yep. What was that, was that just a, a what was happening in the school or? Yes, yes, it was uh, primarily the class. And then I had a, a classmate who liked to draw cartoons and draw things and I liked to write things. So we pretty much collaborated and, and put together this, um, I can't remember what our, what our print run was. <laughs> I don't know if it went beyond the 35 kids in class or if it went, I, I don't remember exactly. Uh, but yeah, that, that, was, that was big. But I had, but even before that, I, or maybe just after that, I was um, one of my first, I remember one of my very first like real writing things was to want to make a, either a play script or a screenplay of Little Women. Since that time, there've been about 20 <laughs> screenplays and film productions of Little Women, I think, including like two in the last two years. But um, yeah, so I was, and, and uh, it was all, you know, partly it was to support my own performing in these things, but partly it was, it was just, you know, I, I liked writing, I liked adapting and, and uh, that was, so I was always, always into writing for sure. Which was and, more difficult, writing the screenplays or writing, because you were a screenwriter as well for documentaries. What was more challenging, the screenplays or, or novels? Well, um, 
when you're doing documentary film, it's very collaborative and it's so you're not working on your own the way you are with a novel. So, and, and it's the same in theater or any kind of film. So I've gone to, from working, my, my working life, creative life from casts of dozens, maybe not hundreds, but you know, like big time, lots of people involved and meetings and people and editing rooms and, and working on a script and then revising shooting scripts and all this kind of stuff to being me by myself alone in a room with my books and my dogs and my Ginger Rogers movies. And so, so sometimes I think, wow, this is um, a big change because, you know, you, you collaborate with, you're, it's, you're involved with editor, agent, you know, the whole production side of it, the art department, the marketing and publicity. And so you do interact with people as a writer, don't get me wrong. And the best part, of course, is interacting with readers, going to bookstores, doing uh, events and things like that after it's after all the hard work is over. Uh, but it's it's just funny sometimes when I think about the twist of my life that I was always like the solitary writing part, but I always had much more of the collaborative, active, um, you know, in the theater, you, you work all night and you sleep all day. <laughs> you know, the, the whole time shifting thing of the working day, that's also another thing where sometimes I go, wow, I used to be such an Ida owl. And now it's sort of like, hmm, I'm happy to close the laptop and go to bed at a normal hour. None of those late nights and after rehearsal, your adrenaline's going or after a production your adrenaline's going is like okay now let's go eat let's go drink let's go dancing <laughs> I think how did I do all that? <laughs> when you were in rehearsal and you were reading through the screen or through the uh through the parts uh, the screenplay for when you were doing uh, acting did you ever uh, have to stop and say um you know what this doesn't make sense you know did you <laughs> come out and say well, yeah you know what this doesn't make sense maybe you should go this way I don't know when you're doing Chekhov or Shakespeare or Moliere you kind of don't, I mean, the actors tend not to do that. The directors do, we, you know, they, they adapt and cut scripts more than the actors, but um, no, I, I took direction pretty well, but, but, but I have to say what more, part of my transition from performing to production was the, the more wanting to be in control and more wanting to be the, the decider or the more on the creative side instead of the okay stand over here and say your line like that kind of thing I mean it was it wasn't a rebellion or anything it was just a natural progression but it was it was definitely um you know I, I enjoyed I enjoyed the theater and the you know doing extra work and all that kind of thing but I'm glad I don't do it now <laughs> Well, you mentioned that, uh, you know, normal hours and closing the laptop and finish. What is your your uh, routine for writing? We've had some say that they like to get up in the morning when everything's all nice and quiet, a cup of coffee or some tea, do some little writing then. Some will just stop what they're doing. All of a sudden, just go right over, start writing. Um, some will do it later on in the evening. What was your what's your favorite time to create? Depends how close I am to a deadline. If I'm on deadline, I'll just keep working. <laughs> I'll start in the morning and stop it whenever. Um, I I don't. I'm not. It depends if I'm on contract and what my what my contracted deadline is as to how or much I organize my time. If I'm writing a book on spec, which which means it does it's not contracted to a publisher yet, then and I can kind of figure out how long, you know, I can take longer to write the book. So I'm not quite as rigorous. And if it's gardening season and I want to be in the garden, then the garden might get priority. Um, so it, it just depends where I am in the book, but I, I can write through almost anything. Um, I, my great, my great secret, would, I mean, I used to blow people's minds like this. I used to write romance novels set in the era of Jane Austen listening to Nirvana and Green Day headbanging. I mean, that's, <laughs> I, seriously, I, I can, I, I like having um, oral uh, audio stimulation and I like, um, you know, I write books with uh, Turner Classic movies on or I write books with CNN on in the background or I have classical music on or talk radio or um, 
psychedelic furs or you know my green and green day's greatest hits i i'm not i'm not one of those it's like i don't have to have dead silence i don't have to you know be all closed off i've got a husband my husband might be sitting over here reading the newspaper and talking to himself because i'm in another world dogs piled on top of me on the sofa and i'm just sitting there in my own little world so <laughs> um i i I've, it's a very undisciplined form of discipline. I can't even call it discipline. I, but I know where I am. I know where I need to be in the progression of the book. I know. Um, I know when I need to take a break. Uh, just to kind of re, rethink. A lot of the writing happens not when you're not when you're writing. Yeah, when you're listening to Nirvana, working on your book, did you ever have the thought of say, thinking, okay, Jane Austen meets steampunk? <laughs> I wish I had. I mean, they did the Va Jane Austen and the vampire book right. or something like that. But no, that's for another writer. I tend to be, um, do this more straight. I haven't done any mashups like that yet, but, but who knows? Who knows? Uh, well, you did mention that you're working on a couple more things. So uh, we've been, you know, talked to a few who can only just do one book at a time, um, but you can have multiple multiple stories going on how do you separate them do you have them on different files in your computer do you have them in different notebooks i do have different files on the computer um and also the every everything can be at a different stage so so i've got a book if it's about to go into production and i'm doing a last proof proofread then that time is being taken away from the really exciting brand new book where I, that I'm just starting and I've been researching and I'm really ready to write it and so there's there's always a tension between um, what do I need to do what do I want to do but but I'm not the kind of writer who, who is like actually writing two books at the same time I may be working on different books in different phases like I've just finished um I was working, I felt like I was working on five books um, because I have this trilogy that, that's coming out uh, as a um, new edition in an ebook format. And I, I was proofreading that. And then I have the bo a book that's finished that's about to go into production. And so I, I finally, I think I'm finished. I, th I finished tweaking that because it's got to go out the door. And then I've got this brand new book that I've got that's outlined and I've kind of, you know, I've kind of, kind of started it, but all this other stuff, the timing of that got in the way. So on December for, uh, you know, it's like, I know what day it's like, okay, I'm going to just do that now. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned outline. So is that how you do uh, yeah. most of your books is via outline, not just sort of a free flow type of thing? Well, my, I, because my books are, um, my most recent books are all historical biographical fiction. I have, I have dual timelines. I have the timeline of what really happened in the times um, and what really happened to these people. And then I have the fictional timeline, which is where I get to fill in the gaps of either what we don't know, what might have happened, um, interesting stuff that's, that I make up that's not in the historical record, but no one can tell me it didn't happen because, hey, you never know. Uh, so there, so there, so there's that. So when I'm, I want the history to be accurate, and I also want the creativity of making up a fictional plot. So it's a, it's a balance, and it's a that is very much a mashup. But in order to do that, I have to, you know, I have to make my outlines mesh so that what's happening fictionally and what's happening historically kind of blend together and and also it just helps in terms of timelines because i've done books that cover 10 years i've done books that cover 20 years i've done and and boy you you got to know when to collapse time and when to focus on a particular period in a person's life and so that's that's another part of it just just to keep on track and you know i do all this elaborate preparation and stuff and then I still have to, in the middle of a book, I have to put down everything and research something. It's like, wait a minute, what if this happened? Or did that really happen? Or, you know, and so uh, there are always, it's not just a, it's not just writing and it's not just researching, but I do have to lay the groundwork. So I do a lot of the research up front, but it doesn't ever, it doesn't ever really finish until- Have you ever mixed up? Do I what? 
have you ever mixed up timelines when you're working on one and wait a minute that that's for this book over here no no yeah. not yet <laughs> you ever use uh, friends of <laughs> so some of the spaces that you need to fill in um in in, in the, the the fictional aspect of it have you ever used like uh friends or family as extra characters <laughs> maybe <laughs> well even at that <laughs> Well, you know, it's funny. I can remember when my one of my very first books came out a million years ago, and my aunt, who passed away quite recently, um, when she read it, she she was convinced that all these people that I completely made up were based on, and, and you know, they lived in the 1800s or 17 1800s or something. And she, you know, she was like, "Well, this is, you know, this is my father. This is your grandfather. This one is, you know, this reminds me of." And I'm like. I mean, you just don't know what to say. Um, I don't think she ever said it to me directly. I think I heard it secondhand that she had gone through like a Ramona Clay and had decided that and it was, I always thought that was kind of funny, but that's not to say that people I know, I, I have put people I know in my books. Yeah. So your latest one, uh, Beautiful Invention, it was published through Dark Frog Publishing, which is a hybrid they, publishing they, company for those who don't know. Distributed it. They just oh, they distributed it. Okay. That was okay. A distribution arrangement. Okay. So uh, it, it, they're, they're a hybrid uh, uh, publishing company that does either full manuscript uh, publication or the other half and distribution or just distribution. Um, how was it that you found out about them and you, you said that they were great working with them? Is that how you're going to go with your with your latest novels? Um, I don't know is the answer to the last question. How did I find out about them? Ooh, it might have been, I believe it was through the Independent Publishers Association uh, magazine had an interview or article. No, it was Publishers Weekly. That's where it was. Yeah. Anyway, it was in the trades somewhere and they, um, and I thought it was an interesting way. Um, an interesting concept. And I, I have done, um, uh, your store was a great find in terms of a dart frog store, but I did, I've done when I did book tour last year and, and hit some other stores in different regions of the country that had been mm -hmm. um, supplied through dart frog. And so it, I, it was fine. I was, it worked really well for me. Yeah. We, um, that's how we found out about your book and that's how we got your book uh, was through them. And um, uh, Gordon, even uh, the, the, the head of dart frog, he, emailed me and said, hey, we have this author, you're getting her book, and she's in your neck of the woods. So it was really <laughs> great that, um, so you never know who will pair you up with, you know, so, so that was, that was great to find out. Um, um, so did you, do you, I never, I never looked, I always thought it went through Dart Frog. Um, did you use a traditional publisher or did you do self-publishing? And why did you choose that route versus the other? <laughs> you don't use traditional publishers, they use you. <laughs> <laughs> and I have been used by traditional publishers for the vast majority of my titles. And I, um, my, well, I, it's hard, it's hard to talk about something in a public forum where things aren't fully decided yet. Um, but one, a recent manuscript is has had offers from traditional publishers, um, and a hybrid from a hybrid publisher, not Dark Frog, but from from another one. So, um, I've been in decision mode a lot lately, and just trying. Well, like we were saying before the talk started, um, you know, publishing is in a lot of upheaval right now, and so trying to make these make decisions, and it will probably all come down to release dates. I, it's been two years since Beautiful Invention, Beautiful Invention came out in late 2018. Yeah, it was just after, it was just after we Spencer opened. Picks up her book. When did you come out? I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, 28, fall of autumn of 2018. It, I don't know. It seems like yesterday. It seems like a million years ago. Uh, so, um, any publisher that tells me we're not, we are not able to publish your book until spring or even autumn of 2022, I'm 
not sure I'm down with that because it's that that would have meant four years between books mm -hmm. and I I so that's the kind of stuff I'm wrestling with right now <laughs> and I'll just leave it at that so you yeah, but your past books well even beautiful invention what was what um how did you choose to go the way you did publishing that one um I'm trying to remember uh, I've done every kind of publishing there is. I've had traditionally published books. Mm -hmm. I've had hybrid published books. I've had my own books published because when I left traditional publishing, I grabbed all my agent and I grabbed all of my rights back. So once I owned my stuff, then it could be republished by me. Uh, some of it was published by other people foreign language rights um, and I could create my own imprint to put out some of them as well. So uh, I'm, I go where I, I make the decision based on the, the book, the audience, the timing, like I said, and whether or not um, what the history of the book has been. Like if it's a book that's been published a lot of times, um, in different formats, like this trilogy that's coming out, those books have been, they started in paperback, then they were published in hardcover, then they were, then I published them as eBooks, then, um, and they've been in lots of foreign language editions. And it's been just long enough, much earlier in the eBook revolution that the eBook versions came out. So I decided that it was time for a new, new cover, bundle them all together and, and get them out again, as a, as a, box set, but it's only going to be an ebook, probably the, the, if they were a print book, it would be like 500, it was three, three full novels that are close to a hundred thousand words a piece. So that I'm, wow. I don't think people are going to want a print copy of that. So, um, but and I don't have any audio. That's, um, that's something that has been back burnered by me. And I don't know how much longer I'm going to leave it on the back burner. And since, and I've, Currently, I think I've got rights. I think I've got rights to pretty much everything, so I can. I'm a free agent, so to speak, um, if I want. To when you decide, out. when you decide to do um, audiobook, don't forget Libro FM. Um, but uh, who would you want to? Do you have in mind who would you want to do the voice of Hedy Lamar? Um, or, read the, or, or read the book just in general. Well, I don't remember her name, but there was um, there was an audition for the Hedy, uh, audio audition for the Hetty book, and the the girl that did it, the woman that did it, I really liked, and um, I so that. But in terms of famous person, I don't know someone with an Austrian accent, but who can be uh, who who is um, can be understood well. To speak English, I guess, and and pronouncing the the some of my books, <laughs> I mean, my Isle of Man books. There, people are speaking. It's translated in context, but I throw in a lot of Manx Gaelic words, and also in Beautiful Invention, I throw in. I well, maybe I didn't so much, but um, anyway, she's Austrian, and she, part of the book takes place in Austria. And you know, when you have books with accents and foreign languages and things like that. I think it's a little bit trickier in terms of audio, but I'm not really an audiobook listener enough to, that was kind of, my, that was my um, pressure point, I guess you would say, was that because I don't, I'm not a natural audiobook listener. I felt like I needed to educate myself a whole lot more about the audio options. And I have done some of that, but I've been so busy with the writing that I tend to kind of, like I said, back burner. So there's a lot of, a lot of activity I could be doing that I haven't done yet. But you know, I know audio really, really took off. Ebooks took off a lot since the pandemic, um, big time and certain genres, not all of them. And I, I think audio did as well, so. Do you ever um, think about reading it yourself? What's that? Do you ever think about reading it yourself? I mean, you did a really uh, wonderful job reading that little section uh, uh, from Beautiful Invention. Um, I have, I did voiceover work a lot when I was in radio, TV, film. Um, I 
I would probably, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to do it myself. My <laughs> husband is an audio, uh, is, was a radio guy. He's got an awesome voice, but but not a book reading kind of voice. It's more of an announcer kind of voice. So, um, so I don't think we're going to do any any in home production. But um, yeah, that would be one way to do it. But I I would rather I honestly I would rather farm it out and have the full production and all that kind of stuff. So it's a, a quality product and um, and I wouldn't want to have to. I don't know. <laughs> I've I've heard my voice enough, and and I don't think I could stand the fatigue of the recording session. I used to do, I used to record, um, my big claim to fame was doing voiceover for um, uh, instructional manuals. So, and it was, I always thought it was so funny because um, these would be like for, for um, like audio tapes or back in audio tape days for um, like, I guess auto, shops or mechanical stuff and and it was like they kept hiring me and I said well what's the audience for this oh well you know it's guys that work on cars they just want to hear a girl's voice <laughs> so they're sitting there you know thinking of some pretty girl who knows an awful lot about gear shifts and and alternators and all this kind of stuff and I just thought that was so so funny but I don't know. I think my voice was in better shape back then because I had the stage training and the all that kind of stuff. And now I can go for a week without saying anything to anybody except a dog or a husband. So I don't have the same voice I had back then. What part of self-publishing did you find the most difficult? The, the getting the book out there, finding uh, distribution, marketing, uh, even with traditional publishing too. What, what was the most difficult part? Hmm. I don't know. I, uh, I haven't really found my recollections of when I aren't that difficult because um, people, the independent publishing and independent authors are great at sharing information. So um, there are whole, there are listservs and organizations and there's so much accessible information that is so generously shared that if people want a cover artist or someone or help building up an email list or whatever it might be, there are these forums where you can ask questions and you'll get more suggestions and recommendations and you know people's actual real life experience with the vendors or, or whomever. So um, uh, I, I don't really, I don't really, I can't think of, I, I, I don't know, maybe it's just because I got book brain and I'm not, not thinking like that. Cause I'm, I mean, I'm in the middle of these ebook things and, and um, you know, somebody did the cover and it's been proofread and it's. Uh, um, when you, uh, for proofreading, do you use uh, beta readers? Do you use friends and family? Do you, or is that something that's done by the, the publishing company mostly? Um, publishing companies do it, have in-house people, freelancers um, who proofread. I mean, there are so many levels of editing in the publishing house um, and proofreading. You, you know, you proofread your manuscript before you send it in, and then it goes through all the line editing and then it get, the changes are made and then you get it back. And then the, and then you get the, the galleys or the, you know, first pass proofs where it's been typeset. Um, and that's when you can see all kinds of squirrely stuff that, that nobody caught yet. <laughs> and you have to get those corrected. And then there's a point at which it's been, you know, you're getting good to go and, and you can't make, you're limited in the numbers of changes you can make. And that's so, that, so you want to have it as, as good as it can possibly be. So I proofread um, heavily in the manuscript portion. I proofread on the screen, on the laptop, I print out a few versions and then I edit and then I go back and proof and edit and I go through this whole process myself and then um, at some point it gets line edited and by someone else and then the proofreader looks at the copy and then at some point it gets turned into bell and galleys and then, 
And that's where my husband comes in because um, one thing, there's something about, I don't know what it is, when you get a book and it's printed in bound galleys, which, you know, if you've ever seen ARCs, it says right on there, you know, this is an uncorrected proof, this is not the final final, all that kind of stuff. And you, you think, okay, it's good to go, it's a book, but then you're still finding little things. And sometimes it's just it's words that aren't separated or something like that. But my husband will not proofread a manuscript for me or read a manuscript for me. He says it has to look like a real book. So I love it when I get the ARCs because then the advanced reader copies, because it's bound like a book, it's printed like a book and I can hand it to him and he can mark it up like the good proofreader that he is. But it's so it's like, it, it's two things in one. It's a, it's a hard copy, but it looks like a book and he will help with that. And he, and of course I'm doing the same thing with another copy, trying to find all the gremlins and, and between the two of us. And then sometimes, you know, you can't hire a proofreader to also, you know, a paid outside proofreader to do that too. So you could have three pairs of eyes going over them and um, at the same time. I hope you get all, and you'll still find, and still in the final book, there will be something, I, I, I'm sure, I think, um, I think I found one something in Beautiful Invention, and then I think I found one or two in Pledge of Better Times, and then going back, um, well, reviewing these, this ebook trilogy, you know, these are, were published by Harper Collins, and you know the, the original thought. You know, the the book still. You know, it's all as you just can't escape it. You just kind of have to. You just want it to be as good as possible, so it won't upset the reader. Well, obviously, proofreading and editing is 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 a major important part of the process. What are some of the other really important parts of the process? Of the the writing or the pub. Production, uh, production, pr production. And obviously, I, writing is is you want a good story, so that's one of the most important things: a good cohesive mm -hmm. story. And then, of course, now the production of it is you want the editing and the proofreading to be there, so there's no mistakes. What else is one of the most or the most important parts of of that process? Well, I'm a very visual person, so I'm always interested in what the what the publisher can do, or the format, or what whoever you're working with with the interior look of a book by which i mean the t the chapter headings and whether they use a drop cap at the beginning of a paragraph or the first letter of a paragraph and whether they use flourishes or glyphs at the end of a chapter some kind of little um little flourishy thing um not an illustration but just so that's you know the look of a book to me i think and that on beyond the cover the covers are important i think um, it's weird that in the, you know, so many people, even if they're buying print books, they buy them online often. Um, and then if you're, if a book's being browsed in a bookstore, the back cover copy is massively important, obviously, because, you know, people turn the book over. What's this book about? Is there a picture of the author on there? Do I like the way they look? You know, so that, so the, the whole, um, book buying public, the way they access their reading material, there's a lot of difference. If someone, some people, if they're buying a book on Amazon, they, they have, you know, there's a whole description and then you've got all the, you know, you've got reviews, you've got editorial reviews, what did Kirk or Publishers Weekly say about it? And, and then you've got reader, you know, how many stars did it get or kind of good reviews. And then even though on a print book, Amazon will show the full, um, cover like the cover flat or the front and back cover I wonder how many people actually care whereas in a bookstore if I go in a bookstore man I'm turning the books over all the time you know I'm all about the back cover copy that's that's really important to me because that's where you you get the gist of the especially if it's a new to you author or a different genre than you normally read if it's not an auto buy where you're just oh I know the name on the spine I'm definitely taking that with me I have to read that all the time and I miss I, I do miss the in the bookstore Thing. I mean, I always come out with something I didn't expect, and I always, um, you know, like to see what's on the front tables, what's on the back tables, what's on the special tables, special topic tables, and, you know, if you like this author, you might like that author so that they, they kind of bundle people together, and 
um, help, you know, that discoverability that happens through hand selling, I think is just so, so important. Um, of course, we all know that nobody buys on Amazon anymore because that's on its way out. Everybody gets them from bookshop.org or their local bookstore's sure. website if they're going to order online. And, how, and if you've had a good experience with bookshop.org, I guess. Yes, we have. A lot of people have. And it's, it has saved a lot of bookstores across the country. Unfortunately, a lot still every week, one or two or every couple of weeks, one or two do still close. But there's always a few couple more uh, openings. So it's kind of a, a net zero type of thing, but it's still kind of, you know, heartbreaking that the, the ones that do close are closing. Mm -hmm. um, how, I know, how important is marketing? I know one of the things you do, and we had talked about this when you were live uh, in person here one time, was you would go around to when you were traveling and leave a copy of your book at the airport. Yeah, book bombing. Yes. <laughs> what are some of the other things that you do as far as, well, especially now with COVID? How do you market your books? Well, I haven't had a book out since COVID. And of course, you're, the smart author is always in doing the market actively, whether or not, you know, I mean, even when they're in the middle of writing a book. Um, I, you know, I, I do, um, I'll put together um, little, I haven't done as much lately, uh, but Instagram memes where, you know, I'll take a quote out of the book and, and put a picture and um, the book cover and things like on Twitter today, it's Hetty's birthday and, you know, a picture of Hetty and, you know, it's mostly, it's a lot of social media. I mean, it's like all social media, um, but I also, um, you know, every year at Christmas card time, I, I probably got friends and family that have however many years Beautiful Invention has been out. They probably have a bookmark every year because I put one in with the Christmas cards. I mean, I, that's a, I do mail out so Christmas cards. So, that, you know, I send, little, I send stuff like that. They should be buying the book anyway. If they're right. getting a Christmas card from me, we're close enough that they should be, they should have bought the book and given one to their mother and their father and their brother and sister, aunt, uncle and cousin. But, you know, I'll just, you know, do that kind of thing. Um, one thing, I really, I, I'm uh, frustrated uh, graphic artist, you know, designer kind of person. So I can, I can get in a lot of trouble doing things like um, purchasing high-end fonts and, and um, you know, all kinds of graphics and stock photo. I, I, I'm a photographer also, so I tend to not need a lot of stock photos, but some, but, but I love to look at stock photo sites and, and think up you know, ads and, you know, lots of visual kinds of things to put together for, um, for social media. So that, I, I love to do that. I, I think that's, that's fun. Um, so I've got a, some of a bad, bit of a background in, in publicity and marketing and advertising from way back when, because that was all built into my uh, radio TV film program. And I've always kind of done that. And then once you get in the book business, um, and I, I, I always worked well with the, the publicists and the art departments in my, at my publishers. I've been to, I've been to my cover art you know, when I, uh, in New York. I would visit New York and I would go to the, my cover artist's studio and watch him paint <laughs> cover, my own cover paintings and some of which I bought from him after, they were used on the on the book covers and stuff. So I'm 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 into that kind of thing a lot. And so a lot of that kind of ties into the marketing or can be used for for that and the publicity. But maintaining lists of libraries, bookstores. I've lived in many parts of the country, so I can claim local authorship in, or formal local author, however you want to put it, in various regions of the country, the Rocky Mountain West the South, the Mid-Atlantic, and now New England. So, um, and the Beautiful Invention had a launch um, in London also. So I do some things when I'm over there. I've had book tours in Eastern Europe. Uh, I like the, like the in-person yeah. travel, uh, you know, that, that part of it. it it's uh, kind of a carrot on the stick after you've spent a long time writing a book because you're meeting living, breathing people who like to read books and like to talk about books and are interested in your book. 
you hope. Uh, so, and that's, that's not possible in the same ways that it was, but Zoom, and I've done, um, I've done some book, even before the pandemic, I've done book clubs remotely, meeting with book club members on the phone or on uh, Skype or something like that. So that's, that's been fun. And book clubs, are, I love book clubs. Those are great. Um, you know, sitting around and having some wine and crackers, which I can't eat because if I do, I'll start coughing and not <laughs> while I'm talking. <laughs> <laughs> but the wine, yeah, and um, and people talking about the books, and I always want their book list for what they've read and this year, or last year, or what you know, because I it's just so interesting to me the way that book clubs um, and are they mixed groups? Is it men and women, or is it just a woman's book club? And what do the kind of books do the guys read? Are they different, or what kind of? And it's just so I, I think that's that's a lot of fun. The book community is, is just, uh, the readership community is really, really interesting to me. I know some writers that are very highly, so highly attuned to readership that it, it actually affects what they write. Um, I'm aware of the market itself and where my books fit into the market, but I don't um, only, you know, so back in when I wrote in genres that had really rabid active kind of readership where they would ask you, you know, when are you going to write so and so story or, you know, with, pick up a secondary character and make them a main character, that kind of thing. But I, and I know some authors that, that are, uh, will follow up on that a lot better than I do. I usually kind of always know what I'm going to write next. <laughs> um, but that, that um, fandom is, is very, um, there, there's some very proactive fans out there. In, in especially in women's fic not women's fiction so much mostly in in the romance and historical romance field and now you know now the whole everything is a is a series lots of you know almost all the books now in, in historical romance it seems like you know series books that go on five or ten books as in a series and that's so people really like those kind of connected books and one book after another by the same author. I managed to do a four book trilogy one time. <laughs> I was ready to kill everybody by the end of it. It wasn't supposed to be four books, but I did, you know, have a, I had a way to, to carry it through. And I said, no, never again. Then I did another trilogy, but I stopped at three, like you're supposed to. Yeah. I read um, L. Ron Hubbard came out with a decology yeah. series. I can't yeah. imagine. I was a brilliant series. I loved it. Took me forever to get through it, but uh, I, I can't imagine what it would take, what it took to write 10 huge novels. Yeah. Very detailed, very intricate, and it, it was great. So we only got a few minutes left, um, so, but I did want to ask, uh, what are you reading now? What are some of your favorite authors that you like to read? What type of genre do you like to read? I read across genres, um, mostly. I, I, one, I, I like to read, I don't read them often, but I like to read mystery because I don't think I'm ever going to write like a real mystery. I put mystery in my book sometimes, but I'm not, not going to um, write a mystery series or anything, speaking of series. So I like to read the kinds of books I don't think I'm ever going to write because I turn off that, how did this author do what they do so well and all of that. And I can just read for sheer entertainment. Um, I have a book that I'm, when I can read again, which <laughs> when my crunch time is over, um, it's called The Foundling and it's set in, it's an 18th century historical novel uh, about a foundling. Uh, someone puts their child in a foundling hospital home for children and then things happen and I'm excited about that book. I read, um, I read my friend's books. Uh, my friend um, Virginia McGregor who lives here in Concord has a book coming out next year and I got to read it early and I was excited about that. Um, so that's, so I, I keep up with my friends and they write all kinds of stuff. Uh, Virginia's written young adults, she's written adult novels. Um, I read, um, and then I like to go back to books that I, um, authors that I like a lot and maybe used to read often and haven't read recently. Like they've made a new um, 
Netflix has done a new version of Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier. And I like, I've read most all of the Daphne du Maurier books. A lot of, so a lot of them are historical. Some of them are set in the past and that's probably, she, she was probably a big influence on me. And so I've had this kind of, I haven't seen the series. I may, may or the film, I may not watch the new version. Um, but it's got, I've got this little tickle in my brain, like, oh, it's been a long time since I read Rebecca. I think, you know, hmm, boy, I, that's a, that's a good book. I really like it. So I, so I may go, you know, find an oldie but goodie and read it. But at the moment, I'm, anything I'm reading now is nonfiction and it's for research when I'm able to read, but I'm not reading this week. <laughs> Proof but not reading, reading. There you go. Oh, oh, and I like true crime. I, I mean, I, you know, nonfiction, it, mostly I'm reading history or biography that's, that's research, but, you know, sometimes, but I like musical biographies. I've been sitting on uh, a Warren Zevon biography that I've got had sitting on the shelf unread since it came out a couple of years ago. And um, it's not the one by his ex-wife, but it's a, it's a later one. And, and then, um, Oh, I read Bruce Springsteen's autobiography. Um, not right when it was published, but but later. But uh, uh, confession, I have one of those um, little free libraries in my front yard, which is really great because um, I get first dibs on anything <laughs> people put in there, and I also I get to I get to see what kinds of books people like to read by what they put in the little library. So I I have um, I confess uh, plucked. Um, a, couple, a couple of fiction and nonfiction things out of it. One is The Real Lolita, and um, I can't remember what the other one was. So I've got, I've got my reading material ready to go when, when I'm able to, to do that. So as you see, I mean, it's just, it's very eclectic when I'm reading strictly for pleasure and not, not for book research. Great. Well, that's our time. And I'd like to thank uh, my reporter for joining us today, uh, Pledge of, of Better Times and Beautiful Invention, both can be found uh, at, in our store and uh, through our website. Again, there's always bookshop.org too. And uh, thank you very much for joining us. And I, I can't wait to have you back into the store. Chris, I can't wait to be back in the store. Your store is so wonderful and you're so supportive of local authors and please know that we all appreciate it. And I especially appreciate the invitation tonight. And I especially appreciate the fact that you were the one that um, knew it was going to be Hedy Lamar's birthday on November 9th when we were trying to find a date. You came up with that. And I was sitting there going, why didn't I, why didn't I think of that? That was, that was just so brilliant. And I'm so glad you did. I've been so excited all day. It's like, oh, I'm, going, I'm having a Hedy Lamar birthday party with Chris Upton. And, you know, I, I just think that was genius. So thanks for that. That was, that was great. You're welcome. No, thank you very much and have a good night. Okay. Hope to see you soon. Bye.